So welcome everybody. I'm Margie Levin. I'm the Assistant Regional Director here at ADL Southwest located in Houston. And I am really, really, really excited about today's program because we are here to welcome Judith Finkel, who has had a lot of um, experience and um, participation with ADL. Um, first and foremost, she has, uh, she currently serves on our board. She was instrumental in our women's initiative committee and getting that started. But she also is involved in so many other things. Judith is originally from Pittsburgh and was a middle school studies teacher and for a few years before becoming a stay at home mom. When she and her family moved to Houston, Judith decided to go to law school and she ended up graduating from the University of Houston Law School and then became a corporate lawyer at Conoco or as we know at Conoco Phillips for 24 years. Before she retired in 2020, 2002, Judith signed up for a novel writing colloquium at Rice University. And then she started writing in, 2008, in 2008 when she entered a Fireside Publications National Competition. And I think she might be talking to us a little bit more about that. Since that competition, her works have appeared in newspapers, journals, magazines, and have garnered national attention and international prizes. In addition to an unkosher death, which she is going to be talking about today, she's also published The Stooge Gene, Where Danger Lurks, and the award-winning legal thriller, Texas Justice. So today, we've invited her to come and share some wisdom and experience on how a professor, a minister, and anti-Semitic comments have challenged her to find her voice, persevere, and become a published author. Welcome, Judith. And to get us started, I would love for you to start off by sharing um, a little bit more about your ADL experience, because I understand that perhaps your ADL experience really started quasi when you were in high school. So welcome, Judith. So excited to have you here. Let me unmute you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, what happened was that when I went to high school, I was the only Jewish child in the whole high school. And in those days, the day before graduation, a, a minister would come and talk to us to try to inspire us. And the minister who came told the story of the Good Samaritan. Well, in case anybody didn't realize that the priest and the Levite who left the Good Samaritan, who left the uh, traveler by the side of the road, in case they didn't realize that they were Jewish, he made a point of telling everybody that they were Jews. And I was sitting next to my mother and I said, I'm going to walk out of here. <laughs> she said, no, no, handle it later. So um, being a good daughter, um, I waited till I got home. I called the church and I asked to speak to the minister. And um, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was using ADL methods when I spoke to him, because what I said to him was, I know you didn't mean it like this, but I was sitting in the auditorium as the only Jewish child in my whole high school. And when you kept emphasizing the fact that two people who were acting in, in such a, an ungenerous way um, were Jewish, I said, it really made me think, boy, what are all my friends going to think of me now? And to the man's credit, he said, you know, he said, I never thought of it that way. He said, and I'm really sorry that I did that to you. But he said, more importantly, what you've convinced me of is that I need to change the way I talk about that story in the future. So I called my Aunt Mimi. I told her what happened. And she said to me, someday you are going to be on the board of the ADL. And so, and so that's why I always say that was my, that was my quasi ADL experience at the age of 17. Another issue that Margie and I had talked about um, before was she had asked me about um, whether there was any kind of experience of, of anti-Semitism in my writing career. And 
one of the interesting things is it wasn't directed against me specifically, but I had decided after there was a, a, a case here in Texas about a Jewish college student with no history of violence who was accused of a horrible murder and then a horrible attack. And I decided I wanted to be inspired by that story, but fictionalize it, have completely different characters, have it end any way I wanted it to. But I wanted to do research to make sure that I, I was, although I'm an attorney, I'm not a trial attorney. And so I wanted to make sure I did everything right. So I read 42 volumes of the trial transcript. And in doing that, I discovered a number of things. One was that the assistant district attorney struck the only four Jewish people who were in the jury panel from the jury panel. And when she was questioned about it, she said, she denied it was because they were Jewish. She said, well, the women don't like me. And I could tell in particular that those four didn't. And so she was able to get away with doing it. Then during the trial, in case anybody didn't guess from the accused first and last name that he was Jewish, whenever she used his name, she always used his middle name, Yitzhak. So there could be no doubt but that the jurors knew he was Jewish. And then based on newspaper articles, I realized that what had happened was in the real case, um, the uh, district attorney got a call from the accused attorney and in getting that call, he was asked, you know, can my client leave the country? And he said, sure, we never, we've not indicted him. We haven't taken his passport. And shortly after uh, the accused left, they did indict him so that it appeared to everybody as though he had just left because he was indicted. People just didn't get that timing right. And so what happened was, according to news reports, there was posted around the Jewish Community Center um, postings that said things like, you know where he is, help us bring him back to justice. So even though this was a fictionalized account of what happened, I put those incidents in there because I thought it was really important for people to understand how you can influence people during a trial by coming up with ways to make the accused seem like the other. And when I say I read 42 volumes of the trial transcript, this was largely because of the professor. And I will tell you more about the professor later, but as Margie mentioned, I was in this um, really seven semester um, novel writing colloquium at Rice. And although it was Professor uh, Kolkarni, we just called him the professor. And you knew who we meant when we said the professor. And you'll, you'll understand why. But the professor always said, the first, you must, you must, you must research first. Because even the most minuscule fact, because the first time your reader reads something they know is factually wrong, they will stop reading your book they will never read another book that you wrote. And I took that to heart in my second book, uh, Where Danger Lurks, was about child sexual abuse. And I mean, I met with um, CPS caseworkers, CPS supervisors. I spent a day at the Children's Assessment Center. And even when I wrote my third book, which was much more personal, it was The Stooge Gene, um, recollections of my zany Jewish family, because I'm related to the Three Stooges, which nobody ever seems surprised about. Um, but anyway, even there, I reviewed the movies that I of theirs that I put in the book just to make sure I had remembered them correctly. And then with this fourth book, those of you who've had a chance to read it know that the rabbi frequently, at least three or four times, winds up um, quoting from Rabbi Telushkin's books. And again, I couldn't take any chances that I would say something incorrect. So I read two volumes <laughs> of his books just to make sure that the three or four or five times he was mentioned that I was doing it correctly. And, and this will get me into talking about the book itself. And it is, um, it is a mystery. And the question is, 
whether the president of a small Houston Jewish congregation has died by accident or suicide or murder. And the person who has to figure this out is the rabbi, Rabbi Deborah Stein. And what happens with when I started writing this book is again, the professor's words came back to me. And he said, no one can be all good. No one can be all bad when you write a book. No character is all good, just like no person is all good or all bad. And so while I you know, felt good when I read some of the reviews on Amazon and people would say things like this lovable rabbi, well, yeah, I hope you do find her lovable, but you also understand the problems she has and how she doesn't always handle them in the best way. And of course, one of her problems is that her congregation is just completely split um, over those who think that we're dealing with an accident, those who think we're dealing with a suicide, and those who think we're dealing with a murder. So she's trying to keep her congregation together. And in the meantime, the president of the congregation who never wanted a female rabbi in the first place is trying to ensure that she does not get her um, contract renewed. So she's got that. Then in her personal life, she has a son who is 14 years old and is very troubled. Um, and she has, to, she has to deal with him and um, he, she's widowed, um, so she doesn't have, um, he doesn't have a father who can help, can help out. And this again gets back to the professor because the professor always said, not only do you need a plot, but you need either one or more subplots. And her son becomes one of the subplots, uh, actually not the major subplot, the minor subplot, because we know that she left California and her pulpit there because of something her son did. We don't know what it was until almost at the end of the book. Um, her bigger, the bigger subplot deals with um, someone who is, she's romantically interested in and is fighting it. And the reason she's fighting her romantic feelings for Tom Johnson is he's not Jewish and she's a rabbi. Um, he came to her because uh, after he retired as a criminal attorney, he had been raised with no religion at all, and he wanted to learn about various religions, and he went to her to learn about Judaism, which, gives, which gave me a chance to um, have a lot of information about Judaism in there. And again, the reason this also goes back to the professor the professor said, always try to give your reader a twofer. You want, number one, to have a really good, interesting plot and characters. But number two, if your reader feels like, when I finish this book, I've learned something new, the reader is really happy. So that gave me an opportunity to do that. The other thing the character of Tom did um, besides having a possible romantic relationship is, um, he also was a springboard for giving us some information about just how a case like this would be handled by the police uh, because he, he had been a, an assistant district attorney. So she's concerned about her feelings for him because again, she's a rabbi and he's concerned because he's afraid he will uh, ruin her um, professionally. And again, this no one is all good, no one is all bad. On the one hand, you hopefully like the rabbi enough that you want to make sure whoever she might become romantically involved in is somebody who deserves her. But on the other hand, he can't be perfect. And so what I had to do as an author was bring you back through his memory of things that he's not proud of, things in his life. And, and there's most he'll, he's willing to discuss with Deborah, but there's at least one that he's not. And so he has to be, that's the way we have to create him as, as a writer. He's got to have this appeal, but yet not be perfect. Another character who we had the opposite problem with 
was the person who wound up, uh, whose vehicle wound up hitting the victim. Um, Lee is so, she's so narcissistic. I really hated being around her when I wrote about her. I mean, I, I really did. But again, nobody is all bad, just like no one is all good. And so what I had to do was she had a best friend who talks to the rabbi about what a help Lee was to her when her husband was um, undergoing treatment for cancer and Lee was taking care of her children. And even the rabbi herself comments on Lee's generosity. So again, we can't have anyone who's all bad um, is, is what happens to us. Um, another character um, who is very difficult to deal with when you're writing a mystery is the victim. And the reason the victim's hard to deal with is, as a writer, you don't see very much of the victim before she's gone. And yet you wanna make sure that the reader cares enough about her that the reader wants to know what happened to her. So what you have to do is after her death, you have to have people remember her, um, talk about incidents that give the reader the opportunity to come to know someone who was very quickly out of the picture. And then another really big problem in writing mysteries in particular is that how much information do you give? In other words, I read mysteries all the time. If I come to the end of a book and I feel like the solution, that I never had a hint as to what the solution was, I feel cheated. I'm actually angry. Um, I really am. So I never want to be in a position where the reader comes to the end and says, what? On the other hand, you have to be so careful not to give out so much information that in the middle of the book, the reader says, well, this is obvious. I don't have to keep reading. So it's just this giving enough information that at the end of the book, the reader says, oh, wait, she gave me, now I understand the hints she was giving. So you can't give too many and you can't give too few. And that really is a delicate balance when it comes to, um, to being a mystery writer. Well, I promised you that I would talk to you about the professor. And what happened was Rice University had this novel writing colloquium. And for the first six semesters, each semester, you had to meet with the professor after level one, after level two, all the way. And at any time he would say to students, you have a choice, you're not ready to move on. You can either drop out of the program or you can repeat this level. Well, I will tell you, I always walked into his office in trep trepidation. Fortunately, um, you know, he, he passed me along every time. And, but as you can imagine, the class, we had fewer and fewer people in classes. And by the time we finished the sixth level, he invited some of us to come to his advanced class. The second day of the advanced class, he walked in and he said, I've been diagnosed with leukemia. He said, I'm going to have a bone marrow transplant but I have to be in isolation for a number of weeks at Anderson. He said, so we're conducting class at Anderson. <laughs> so I don't know how they do it now and when people are in isolation, but when we went, um, what happened was um, we, we would be out in a the hallway, they would open these drapes and we would see the professor in his bed with a microphone. And we would each read our chapter. He would ream us up one side and down the other, <laughs> just like he did in class, telling us everything that was wrong with our writing, and um, then go on to the next person. And um, we were, none of us could imagine going on without the professor, but um, he did not survive. And um, 
Rice University called us in and um, they said, we have a problem. Um, we don't have any class to send any of you to. Basically, we have beginning writing classes, but obviously, you know, you went through six levels and now you're in advanced class. So what we decided, if you will accept our offer is, we will let you meet on our premises for free, but in return, you have to agree that you will conduct the class just as the professor did. So we agreed, we showed up and, 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 and conducted the class like the professor did. By that, I mean, when somebody said to me, well, after I read and somebody said to me, well, as the professor would have told you, <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was going to be reamed up one side and down the other. <clears throat> and it was really, really helpful, though. What happened was, though, one of our members was 90 years old, and a couple of people saw her driving and decided that we should meet at her house so she didn't have to drive to Rice. So we started meeting at her house, and at 90, the um, AM Press wanted to publish her book. And as, as she told us the story, they said, it'll be ready in 18 months. And she replied, do you know how old I am? And so her book was published in six months. And um, so she got to enjoy it um, for, for a, a little while. So it, it worked out really well. Um, the other thing I, I always get a question about and I was gonna share with you um, is that um, people always ask, well, you know, how do you go about writing a book? And there's two different ends of the spectrum. There are people who write such a detailed outline, they may spend more than a year writing the outline. And it is so good, that so complete, that they actually can take some dialogue from the outline and put it into their book. The other end of the spectrum are people who just have characters in mind. They start writing the book. They have no idea what the plot is, so they don't know what the story is, how it starts, how it ends, basically. And I will tell you that I'm somewhere in the middle. On the one hand, I don't, I, I can't imagine starting a book, my, me personally, I'm not criticizing anyone who does this. I personally could not start a book without knowing the plot, knowing how it was going to end. That's just me. But on the other hand, I also am not someone who's going to write this outline because I want to have flexibility. And I'll give you some examples of what that flexibility does for me. When, I, when I'm writing, just before I go to bed, I write I read whatever I've read that day because I figure it's good for it to be percolating in my mind. But before I do that, I, before I go to sleep, I've pretty much figured out what the next chapter is going to be like. Well, what will sometimes happen is I start writing the chapter, the characters and their personalities just take it over and the chapter doesn't go the way I expected. But as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, well, yeah, that's exactly how they would act. And I like having that flexibility. If I had an outline, that would be hard to do. And the other thing is sometimes I would write a chapter and then I would read it and I would think this chapter is nothing but a placeholder. And if I were the reader, when I came to this chapter, I would be so bored, I would stop reading the book. And so then I, I Sometimes a whole chapter that I've worked on, maybe even for more than one day, gets eliminated. On the other hand, I've had situations where I wrote a chapter and after I read it and I read the preceding chapter, I'm thinking to myself, wait, there's too much information that's missing here. I'm, I'm, I'm forcing the reader to jump and that's not fair. And so then I put a chapter in between. Um, so I like having that flexibility. So like I said, on the one hand, I do know the plot. I do know how it's going to end, but I like having the flexibility. 
Um, the other thing that people usually ask me about is, um, you know, how do you go about being published? And this is where perseverance comes in because the, um, the professor used to say, the difference between a writer and a published author is perseverance. And to give you an example, I wrote the first book and back then, um, instead of sending in everything um, via, via uh, internet, you know, you actually people, you actually were mailing off chapters to agents. And I had two piles of rejections. I had the ones that were unkind and I had the ones that were kind and I would reread the kind ones. The unkind ones, sometimes people would not even waste a full piece of paper on me. They would just have a strip and to tell, <laughs> to tell me they weren't interested. But then there were people who took the time to write a couple paragraphs and would say things like, I am so sorry that I cannot take any on any new clients because I really feel that you have something here. And, um, and, I, and I'm sure you're gonna eventually get published. And so I would, like I said, I would save those and I would read them because well after a year that I started trying to find an agent, I got word of a publishing company in Florida that was having a contest. And what they said was, um, whoever writes, um, we're, we're going to, whoever writes the best thriller uh, mystery that we think is the best, we will publish next year. And so you submitted so many chapters, it might've been 50 pages. And they wrote back to me and they said, you're one of four people who we want to see the whole book up. So I sent in the whole book and then they said, we're going to send you a contract. So I was really pretty excited. Yeah, that's how the first book got published. And then they were happy with the first book. And so they published my second book. Um, first it was Texas Justice, then Where Danger Lurks. Well, by the time I wrote The Stooge Gene, that book, while it was for the public, it was also for the family. And I just felt like I wanted complete control over that book. Um, and so although the publishing company was happy to publish that, I explained why I wanted to self-publish and they were absolutely gracious about it, said they understood. I self-published that book and I liked the experience so much that when it came to An Unkosher Death, I decided to self-publish. Now I will say this, I wanted the book to look really professional and so I hired someone who knew just how to do both the um, uh, both the Kindle editions and the uh, heart, you know, the, the actual put it in your hand editions, um, who knew how to do them both. And I, I just felt like it was, it was worth, um, it was worth the cost to, um, to, to have someone do that. Cause I wanted, I, I wanted it to look professional, which I, you know, the cover, everything in it, which, which I think, um, she did accomplish for me. So I'm sorry, I've just gone on and on and um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm gonna be quiet and hear some questions. Oh, we could listen to you forever. This is great. It's so much information and we have some great questions already in the chat. Hey. So if you haven't asked your, your question yet, please put them in the chat so that we can cycle through them. There's only one thing I'd like to say, which is sure. I realize not everyone has read the book. As a result, I'm going to tell you the questions I will not answer are questions which give away how the, the plot ends or either the subplots end. But if you've already read the book and you have questions like that, very specific to the book, please email me. I will be happy to email you back. I, I love dealing with, with, with everyone. Um, I, I've spoken at a lot of book clubs and I would just tell a story on myself. It's, it's a little bit of an embarrassing story. But you know, generally the you know book clubs afterwards, a lot of them have said, "When's the sequel coming out?" And I've said, "Not until I have a really good plot." Well, one of the book clubs uh, that had had me appear for my other books said, "You know, let us know when the next book comes out." So I let them know, and they wanted me to come. And then I thought, "Am I tricking them?" Because no one in this group was Jewish. 
And I'm thinking to myself, do they really want to read a book about a rabbi? And I was, I was really, you know, kind of concerned that, that I had kind of tricked them into this. Well, I went there, they were definitely my most enthusiastic audience. And when they wanted a sequel and I told them, I'm really sorry, I just, you know, I don't have a plot yet. They started throwing up plot ideas to me. I mean, they, they really want another book. And, um, and it, I think it goes back to what the professor used to say, that people want a twofer. And they were actually very happy to be learning about Judaism. So, like I said, I'm really embarrassed that I didn't stop and think about that. And then I had such concerns and, you know, I, it turned out I was a fool. <laughs> Not a fool. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Not a fool. So I, um, we have lots of questions. So one of them you've already answered, which was about the sequel. Okay. Um, <laughs> another question, you talked a lot and, and I wrote down um, that the narcissist, and right. you, you spoke about the different characters. And it seems to me that you get very involved and very emotionally connected to these characters. So how was it when you were writing and, and you were disturbed and you were bothered? You said you were bothered by the narcissist. How, as a writer, do you do that and, and be able to strike that balance between creating your character and yet not getting annoyed by them? Um sometimes you do get annoyed by them um but you know on the one hand writing you know is is a solitary profession in a way but in another way i feel like these characters are with me i mean i cannot begin to tell you i hear them i see them sometimes i can smell them um they're there they're they're really there with me and, um, and, and, and you have, a, it's, it, it is much easier, you have a good point. It's much easier to write about characters who you like. I mean, they have their faults, but we all do. They have their problems, but we all do. And it is much more difficult when you're writing about a character who you know you wouldn't wanna know in real life. And that's when, again, I have to hear the professor's voice saying, oh, come on now, there's some good things about her. <laughs> You know, and and then I come up with, you know, um, you know, things like with with her, with with how a, what a good friend she was to someone, how generous she can be. I absolutely um, had to do that. But I had to have the professor's voice there in the back of my head reminding me, come on, come on. Nobody's all bad. Come on. And so then I would come up with it. But it is it is difficult because you're <laughs> with these people all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, you don't turn it off sometimes at night because you might be having conversations with them in your sleep. Exactly. exactly. So another question that came in is what inspired you to take the novel writing class in the first place? I mean, well, actually it's sort of interesting because my, my family inspired, well, I'll go back. When I was a kid, I, for Girl Scouts, I used to get badges for writing plays for my Girl Scout troop. Um, when I was in college, I took a um, short story um, uh, con uh, writing class and um, the professor was very uh, encouraging to me. Um, but, you know, then the, like they say, kind of life gets in the way. But what happened was I was on a vacation with my family and things, when we were supposed to go home, we wound up with this huge delay. I think it was about six hours. And so I started entertaining them because I'd had an idea about a book and I started entertaining them with what the plot would be. And they said, oh my gosh, mom, you need to write that. And I said, I, you know, I, I would really need some, um, uh, you know, some instruction and whatever. And so when I went home, um, I'd gotten something from Rice University and one of the things was this novel writing colloquium. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to join. Now, the irony is that um, the book that I thought I was going to write, and it was the book I first started on, is one I never finished. Uh, it just didn't, um, it, it just wasn't, it wasn't flowing right. It wasn't, it just, uh, but it didn't matter in a way, because that's what got me to the novel writing colloquium. 
Aha. Uh -huh. So there you go. Sometimes paths don't always take a straight, a straight um, shot. So the um, the unkosher death. There's a lot of information about Judaism in there. Tell me a little bit more. I, what was the what was the purpose of having so much information about Judaism? Was it because you you were wrapping the content and dealing with a rabbi and dealing with a synagogue? Do you, and do you think that your connection and your early experience and connection with ADL and your experience may have kind of led you to that and led you to putting in maybe more information about Judaism than perhaps you would have if you didn't have those experiences? That's part of it, but a bigger part probably is that I loved the um, the rabbi books that were written by Kemmelman many years ago. Rabbi, the uh, Friday, the rabbi slept late. Saturday, the rabbi went hungry. And I really liked the way that he gave us that twofer. It, he had the mystery, but what he did is he had the best friend of the rabbi be a Catholic police chief. And so they would discuss the differences in the two religions. And I found that part about, you know, learning about religion really interesting. And, and so when, but when I went to write my book, I wanted to modernize it. And I wanted to have a female rabbi and, um, and you know, give it a, a modern setting. And so because she is a rabbi, there's basically no choice <laughs> but, to, but to get Judaism in there. Um, and, um, you know, I, I enjoyed the reading that I did. I enjoyed what I've learned at classes at Beth Yesharon and services at Beth Yesharon and Devars at Beth Yesharon. And um, so it just, and, I, and there's a lot of female rabbis I've really admired. And so it just sort of, all wound up flowing. Um, it really did. So it's interesting that you you chose also a female rabbi because in in the rabbinate and in Judaism, being a female rabbi is is pretty new ish. Um, the reform movement started with ordaining female rabbis. Conservative movement started in the late eighties, I believe. So that's that's a pretty new. Um, piece to put in. So question for you, um, why did you choose a female rabbi uh, versus a male? And um, well, let's start with that. Okay, well, first, uh, uh, you know, I will tell you what I, what, what I didn't mention, <clears throat> those of you who read the book know that actually being a female rabbi does cause some more personal problems for Deborah. Um, and that is one thing with Deborah, be, be, you know, she she doesn't always handle all of her problems ideally. But again, she's like all of us, um, I would say. But one of her problems is that her parents are or orthodox. Her brother is ultra orthodox. Her parents do not treat her like a rabbi. They act as though she's a glorified Jewish studies teacher. They, because they won't accept it. So you're, you're absolutely right. But in, you know, in writing a book, you want to have a lot of conflict. And so basically, by her being a female rabbi, I was able to have conflict with her family who don't live in the same city. I was able to have conflict with the, um, it, with the incoming um, president of the synagogue who never wanted a female rabbi. And um, so it really gave me opportunities, choosing a female gave me those opportunities. And I think the other thing is what I mentioned before, there's just been a lot of female rabbis who I've really admired and I wanted to give them a starring role. I love that you wanna give them a starring role. and. One of the reasons why we asked you to come and share your insights is uh, you're part of the founding group that founded the ADL Southwest Women's Initiative. 
And um, this past month, we celebrated Women's History and we celebrated International Women's Day. So it, I love that the, the main character in Unkosher Death is a female rabbi. But I, and you know, you, you sought her out because of the challenges um, that that comes with. But as a woman uh, author, which is a little bit also not totally, not, I, won't, I won't say is it normal, but there are far more men um, in this field than women. So what kind of experiences have you had? What kind of things have you um, faced? Uh, and, and what would you say to other women who want to kind of break those barriers and break those, those biases or glass ceiling in whether it's writing or any other profession, what would you say to them? Well, you know, um, it's sort of interesting. I have a friend whose husband does not, and she's a writer herself. He does not buy books from female authors which is pretty funny considering that she's one. And so she said that, you know, she actually considered just using her initials uh, or using a name that could be male or female. So, um, and she claimed, I've never seen any studies of it, but she claimed her husband was not an anomaly, um, that there were just a lot of men who don't wanna read a book um, by a female author. Um, I. I will say though, that I actually think I had more difficulties in, in whether you wanna say the, the glass ceiling. Um, when I was an attorney um, and um, I had a very interesting experience with someone who became one of my best friends. Um, what happened was um, we, were at, we were at a meeting and it was the first time I ever met her and we were with outside attorneys and I would say something which and this was just very typical nobody would comment and then a little bit later some man would say the same thing I said and everybody would say that's great and my newfound friend Patricia anytime that happened she would say oh yes I like the idea when Judith mentioned it a couple of minutes ago <laughs> after she did that three times <laughs> Nobody did it again during that meeting, but um, that was the sort of, and I did, I said to her after the meeting, I said, we are going to be friends for life. And it turned out that we have been, um, but, but that was the sort of thing that, um, you know, you, you, you experienced. Um, it was just the way it kind of the way it was. Um, and so you had to pretty much stand up for yourself and, and it, it, you know, didn't always look nice to say, yeah, I think I mentioned that before. So it was wonderful to have somebody else who did it for me. I have no idea uh, whether uh, my author friend is correct and that there are men out there who will not buy a book written by a woman. So I, I, just, I just don't know. Um, you know, in terms of the reviews, um, like on Amazon and stuff, you can't tell whether they're male or female who are, you know, so I, I, I just honestly can't answer that. So for some of us who are participating in this and want to get started or don't even know where to get started or how to get started, help. What, what would you say? I would still say, you know, and, and especially I was just very fortunate that they had the novel writing colloquium, but I do think it helps to get some instruction. And I, I don't know, I suspect that Rice is still has some beginning classes. Um, and um, I, I think, I think it's really worthwhile to get some instruction. You know, everybody just thinks you can just start writing, but it helps to have somebody who's given you some guidance and and also and frequently in classes like that your classmates besides the instructor you know critiquing your work your classmates will and i also know that you know our group that stayed together after um, the professor passed away um, we were very hard on each other 
And I will say one thing to be very careful about if you start writing is if you join a writer's group and all everybody does is praise everyone, you're in the wrong writer's group. You, you need, if you decide to join a writer's group, it really needs to be one where people will ream you up one side and down the other. Um, that's the only way that you can learn anything. And so I would say, be very careful with that. But I do think, I, I think that the instruction I got from the professor, you know, just has stayed with me, has made a big difference. And um, so I would say, try to get, try to find somewhere here in Houston, I would suspect various colleges, but, but I, I really am a big fan of writing classes. I think that's great. And I think it's, it's, challenging to find to strike that balance between finding your voice sharing your voice and understanding your inner critic because sometimes we're harder on ourselves than our critics are or sometimes our critics are harder on ourselves and we need to wake up and pay attention <laughs> absolutely so we're we're about um at the end of our hour and before we wrap up i i just wanted to ask you um, if you had to do something different or you wanted to do something different as a child or as a young adult, um, seeing now where you have gone um, from your, your career as a, an attorney and now as an um, award-winning author, what would you do differently? Well, you know, it's sort of interesting because when I was a child, I wanted to be an attorney and my dad was an attorney and my dad was very discouraging. Um, you know, he, he later explained to me, he, he, he would, I mean, I hate to repeat this, but he said, oh, there are, there are men, women, and lady lawyers. I mean, he was really, at the time that he was practicing law, the women who were practicing law were really tough and they had to be, there was no choice. So he was very discouraging about it. And I wound up in teaching, which I absolutely loved. I love teaching. We moved here to Houston at a time when they had too many teachers and I couldn't get a job as a teacher. And my husband said to me, as long as I've known you, because he known me since I was 13, he said, as long as I've known you, you always wanted to be an attorney. He said, why not do it? And um, I thank God he was so supportive. And so I went to law school, even when I had, you know, young children, uh, we would do our homework together at the dining room table every night. And um, before I had um, finals, he would take the kids on um, camping trips so I could really study. And then I loved my career as an attorney. But when I was, I, I actually started the, the writing class when I was still an attorney. And when uh, Conoco uh, merged with Phillips, you know, they had a package if you would um, set, you know, agree to leave. And so I put in my name to leave and I was told, no, this wasn't meant for someone like you. Well, I am persistent. And I kept saying, you know, but you don't understand this way my dream can come true. Anyway, they finally, to shut me up, they uh, said I could leave and they gave me the package. And, um, and then I, you know, got to start writing. So, you know, I was fortunate in that I've enjoyed all three careers. I, I, I really enjoyed teaching. Um, and I, I even wound up um, doing some volunteer work with, with foster kids and in, in, in their reading. Um, uh, though I had taught junior high, um, I guess they call it middle school now. Um, and I, and I, I liked being an attorney. Um, I think at a corporation because I felt like I was, you, you know, I was in a position to stop legal problems by by how we could handle things ahead of time. Um, so I, I like that, and and I you know, and I've also loved writing. So I I was fortunate in that I've liked all three. I've, I've really liked all three of my careers. And all three of your careers taught you and now all of us find your voice challenge bias or roadblocks when they come in your way persevere 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 
and don't back down <laughs> and and um yeah stand up and 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 be be who you are so i want to thank you judith for spending this time with us um it, this was delightful and i i hope um i don't know maybe is there something else on the horizon that we'll be reading and if we oh. haven't read yet we can go to amazon and get unkosher death and the other books on Kindle and Amazon. But before we all say goodbye, um, is there something on the horizon we should know about? No, I'm I'm still, I, I, I absolutely am determined not to start a sequel until I really feel I have something that I would be proud to have my readers read. You know, when we, when we first, um, first day of class, the professor had asked us, what do you want to accomplish? And most people talked about becoming, you know, famous authors and making millions of dollars. And it would, when it came to my turn, I said, I would like to write a book that my friends enjoy reading. And now I figure like all of my readers are my friends. <laughs> and so what I want to do is I want to, I want to write a book. I, I'm not going to start writing a book until I feel convinced my friends are going to enjoy it. I love that. Well, Judith, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it immensely. I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And for everyone else who joined us, thank you very much. This concludes our program for today, but we hope to have more like it. Have a great day, great week, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.